Today, we have Ambassador uh, Omar Saif Gobash. There are a few seats in the front if you're looking for one. On his book, Letters to a Young Muslim. And this is about how to be faithful to religion while navigating the complexities of today's world. He's uh, the UAE's ambassador to Russia since 2009. He's an entrepreneur and philanthropist and a supporter of the arts. He's a member of the advisory board at the International Centre for the Study of Radicalization and Political Violence at King's College London. And he's a thought leader on moderate Islam and the future of the Arab world. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to the ambassador and Anthony House. Thank you. Thank you for being with us today. Great. Thank you. Uh, I very much enjoyed reading this book quickly over the weekend. And um, I'm, I'm a book writer. And uh, I think about two thirds of the way through, you mentioned that you write in books as well, which made me feel much more comfortable because I, I was very I, worried that you would see how much I'd marked up. I your think book I ran thing. out of things to say then. <laughs> um, so one of, one of the primary prisms through which you write is the death of your father, who was assassinated when you were young. Um, and it's clear that it was a formative experience for you, but it's also affected the way that you see the world around you. Um, did, did you find that in the process of writing this book, you, it changed the way that you thought about that experience? Uh, yeah, certainly. Um, actually, I, I was unable to think about the experience for a very long time. Uh, and uh, when I finally got right, uh, around to writing the book, um, uh, in, in a sense, I was facing my own kind of fears about uh, you know, thinking about my father, uh, you know, for, for many, many years, uh, I was unable to look at a photograph of uh, my father. And, you know, we've got photographs of my father uh, in my library and other places. But, uh, you know, quite often I would just turn the photograph uh, down. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, I had to, uh, um, I, I, it was quite liberating thinking uh, about him uh, and thinking of uh, the ways in which, um, you know, we imagine fathers to be. So, yeah, still painful. And still uncomfortable, so apologies. Um, <laughs> and obviously it is uh, written in a set of letters to your son. Yeah. Has he read it yet? Have you had any feedback? <laughs> <laughs> well, he's a 16-year-old, so uh, he, he has better things to read, like Snapchat, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, you, no, I don't, I don't want to burden him with, uh, with reading the book. Uh, you know, I've already burdened him with other things. Yeah? Uh, so he's taking his time about it. Uh, I speak to him every day and I sort of mutter stuff about the book and say, you know, you, you might have read it by now, no? Uh, <laughs> and he's like, uh, no, I've got it here. He has the, the original version, the, uh, the advanced copy, mm -hmm. which uh, is like a missing a, a paragraph and, and the dedication. I'm like, <laughs> just you know, ask a friend to read it and, and they can summarize it. For you, you know? I have a pretty good summary. I can. <laughs> um, you mentioned Snapchat and, and one of the themes that sort of recurs through the book is the role of technology yeah. in um, the formation of the individual. Uh, do you think that that is in the nature of internet technology generally, or are there particular features of, you mentioned Facebook and Facebook profiles? Yeah. That I, I, I feel I should have mentioned Google in some way, but I, <laughs> I didn't. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Facebook should have invited me, right? <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> Um, uh, just for the record, I, I didn't really sleep much last night because the uh, uh, flight was overnight. So um, if, I, if I ramble or I don't sound coherent, it's because of British Airways. Uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, it's also quite, quite daunting to speak about um, technology and its effects on people uh, when I'm at a technology company. I actually want to think about it more and more. I keep coming back to the idea of um, how technology uh, changes uh, our um, perhaps psychology, how it changes our relationship to each other. Um, and, and how it, uh, in particular, how it sort of intensifies certain feelings and emotions. And I worry very much that, uh, that with, with our, our access through technology to uh, different kind of strands of Islam and also uh, the rhetoric around uh, um, you know, the, uh, Islam being under attack uh, and uh, all the you know, kind of the suicide uh, bombing videos that some, some people I know collect, I think there's a kind of a strange intensification of our uh, religious uh, feelings. And I think that um, it's, it's very unhealthy. Uh, and so that led me to think that we need to actually think about what are the, what are the kind of natural human uh, limits of, uh, of uh, attention to uh, our religion and to, to the questions of piety and worship. 
Um, and so, you know, I feel that uh, it's something that, you know, we should, we should be thinking about. I remember a few years ago, a friend of mine came to me and said, look, he wanted to invest in these earphones that would play the Quran all day long to you. And I was like, well, you know, he said, we'll make a ton of money because, you know, uh, this is the trend. Uh, and I refused to be a um, participant in that. Uh, and it was, you know, to be honest, it wasn't even tempting. It was horrifying, the idea that you could just play the word of God in your ears, tw whatever, 24 hours a day, 12 hours a day. Uh, and I think that's a problem that our clerics are encouraging it. And, and even, you know, some of the more kind of, even lay people are encouraging it, that, that if you have time, then you should be devoting that time to uh, thinking about God, listening to the Quran, uh, and, and not really, well, you know, thinking about God is one thing, but, but it's, it's not actually thinking, right? It's just contemplating, it's, it's a kind of uh, uh, interested emptiness, I think, mm. yeah? Well, you do mention um, late in, the, in one of the later letters uh, that technology has the opportunity to connect people and to humanize yeah. people who are different to us. But sure, it also yeah. has the potential to isolate. Yeah. You are at a technology company. What do you think, how do you think we should think through helping people to connect with technology as opposed to isolating themselves with it? I don't know. I mean, I, I, you know, I, sp I speak to a few friends of mine about this, and uh, it, it, it feels like um, the, the social media in particular has, has the, uh, uh, a more of a negative effect than a positive one, um, locking people up into their own little worlds. Um, and, you know, people, I've, I've heard people talking about it, you know, Republican, Democrat in the U.S., uh, not, not listening to each other's arguments. But when you're locked in, in, a, in a very kind of small, religious, superstitious world that, that we often see uh, in the Middle East, then it becomes really very worrying. Uh, and, you know, add on to that that there is no economic progress, there doesn't seem to be any chance of peace uh, across the region, whether it's Palestine or Israel or, in, you know, places like uh, Egypt and Syria, uh, Iraq, uh, then it becomes very, very bleak. Um, and, I don't know. I mean, I, I, think, I, I think it's also kind of linked to uh, the kinds of information that we uh, receive in the Arabic language. Um, and there's so little penetration of interesting ideas, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've, I've been reading the papers in, the Ar in, in a couple of languages, um, and I sort of compare the way in which uh, people look at the world. And it's incredible that the Arabic language newspapers going back, you know, 30 years, uh, don't seem to have broken out of this kind of very narrow paradigm of the world. Uh, it's always somebody else's injustice to us, uh, inability to, to you know, get anything done. There's always a vast conspiracy. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> it's, it's the other side that, 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 that knows how to manipulate the world. I'm like, you know, something needs to change. Mm. And, and, and your book is obviously a step in the direction of challenging that. Yes. Are there other are there other are there other things that give you hope in in terms of broadening the discourse? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, the uh, people used to think uh, or used to say to me that I was a pessimist, and I thought, well, no, you know, you need you need to pl paint everything black to figure out where the color is, right? Um, and so, uh, yeah, and you also need to figure out where the problems are. And I always felt that we were avoiding the problems. Uh, and I think, you know, in, in this book, what I tried to do was tackle some of the taboo subjects. Uh, you know, one of the, the ones I didn't really tackle is, is anti-Semitism and, and you know, the Palestinian-Israeli issue. That's very, very sort of heated and it's very difficult to get into, maybe, maybe at another stage. Uh, but all of these other subjects, um, you know, people, people ask me, are you not afraid? And I thought, well, okay, well, if I tackle one taboo subject, I'm already in it. Uh, and, you know, there's no backing out, so I might as well do as many as possible. So, <laughs> yeah, so I hope uh, Google will give me asylum somewhere in its... Uh, <laughs> One of your server farms, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, another thing you talk about, and actually it, it speaks to the, uh, the breadth or narrowness of discourse, is the types of questions that people are allowed to ask. Yeah. Um, and how um, excluding certain questions from being asked affects both individual development and, and the way that communities work. Sure. Um, we're a company that first and foremost answers questions yeah. for people. <laughs> so how, 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 should, like, how would you recommend us think through it? Or what, what, could you walk people through your thinking? I don't think everyone's had the chance to read the book. So could you sort sure. of walk us through that? Uh, well, yeah, there's, there's this idea that comes out very clearly in certain Islamic traditions. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm most familiar with the ones coming out of the Gulf, um, which is that 
Islam, the Quran is the answer to everything. Every, all, all, every, all kinds of knowledge are in the Quran. And we say that we're people of the book. And I often used to ask myself, we are the people of one book or many books? And, and you know, the, the, there's a difference in op uh, opinion around that. Uh, but currently the trend is that we are people of one particular book and that all knowledge is contained there. And that's why you get these guys coming up with, you know, all of the evidence of... Uh, uh, of, of you know, sci uh, current scientific discoveries can be found in the Quran if you twist the language in a certain way, and, and you know, they spend a lot of time. I've seen volumes, uh, you know, massive amounts of research on all of the hidden kind of predictions in the Quran about scientific discoveries in the future. And I'm like, okay, well, that's not very interesting. You know? Maybe we're we're, we're loading too much uh, expectation onto onto the book, um, and I I just get kind of. Um, Worried about it because what you find is that people will say, okay, so Islam is the answer to everything. The Quran is the answer to everything. Uh, and so when you come up with some sort of questions from outside, they tell you, no, those are illegitimate questions. You must put them aside. Uh, they shake the foundations of this great, you know, kind of bubble of knowledge that we have. I'm like, well, wait a second though. So, so clearly it isn't the answer to everything. Or at least if it can be challenged by a set of other questions, then it hasn't contained within itself all of the answers. So, yeah, so people will shut down. And I, uh, I, I was with, um, about three weeks ago, I was sitting with uh, a relative, he was about 15, and he didn't want to know about the book. And I asked him, so, you know, well, what didn't you like about it? He said, I haven't read it. I, you know, I just, uh, I don't see why I should read it. I'm like, well, yeah, if you, and he did this on, this was on religious grounds. And so I asked, I, I thought to myself, well, you know, if you read the book, then you'll actually discover that that's precisely what I say. You can't discount an argument until you've heard it. But much of the, the, the uh, kind of the push um, uh, in, in certain religious um, uh, outfits is to say, don't listen to the argument because that's already uh, a sin. You know? it's, it's not to be done. Hmm. I learned a lot uh, in reading the book, um, not least about uh, different strains of Islam, different traditions yeah. within Islam. Uh, but one of the most shocking things I learned is that 70% of the Muslim world is illiterate. Yeah, um, I was a bit shocked by that as well. I mean, yeah, the, the, the numbers vary, but I, I, I was told this by um, you know, the head of a university in Malaysia, uh, the Islamic University, and he said 70%. I, I, you know, I was talking about the Arab world where it's 100 million out of the 350 million, uh, and, which is a number that is growing. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we, we have a massive problem with literacy. Well, it, uh, as people of a book, yeah, a exactly. book or books generally, mm. um, that seems to create a lot of challenges. Do you think that well, it's, it's kind of ironic rest? as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, when when the uh, the Arab Spring took place and uh, you know the revolution in, in in Cairo, I thought to myself, you know, the first thing you guys should do as a, as a young men and women is go out and teach the rest of your population how to read and write, and then maybe you think about you know kind of economic and political reforms. Uh, but, you know, with uh, Egypt, 50% of the population uh, being illiterate, it, it's awful. Um, sorry, you had a question there, I'm sure. Uh, uh, no, oh. just, just what, what's being done? I mean, uh, what? Very, um, well, I mean, the Emirates has a, has a project. Um, it's, it was last year was the year of reading, and it was interesting because they're promoting the idea of reading, and there's all kinds of support for, for kids in particular. Uh, but there was also a program right across the Arab world that the Emirates um, uh, established where they would try to encourage kids. There was a kind of a competitive thing where they would encourage them to read, I think, 50 books a year. Um, and it was, uh, I, I, uh, I don't know, I can't remember how many people got involved in that, but it was in the millions, and it was really wonderful. Uh, but these are, you know, it's like a, a drop in the bucket. And you think about all of the, uh, the wealth in the, in particular, the Gulf region. Um, uh, you can certainly organize uh, greater, greater events like that. But then the other thing is, you know, what are you going to read? Yeah. And that's, a, that's another problem that we have. And so, uh, again, the Emirates has a translation uh, program. Um, it's, they translate about 100 books a year. It's a, a whole bunch of different kind of subjects, everything from Spinoza to, you know, uh, uh, face reading and stuff like that. So, um, but but it's, uh, they're, they're, important, they're important ventures. Hmm. You warn your readers against uh, the seductive appeal of simple solutions to complex problems. Um, yeah. And I think that's not just a risk that we face in one community, it seems but to be. Is, a, isn't it the future of the world now? No? Uh, Starting in about a week? <laughs> yeah. I, I hope not. Right. Um, <laughs> but what do, you, what do you think we can do to help foster an understanding of complexity or respect for complexity? Gosh, these are the most difficult questions I've gotten in the uh, <laughs> 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 So unfair. <laughs> uh, I'm going to try and answer that question in my own way. So.
Um, repeat it, please. Uh, <laughs> how can, how, what, what can we do to, uh, to foster appreciation and respect for complexity, especially in social problems? I have no idea. We're <laughs> trying to figure it out ourselves, yeah. I mean, you know, in the UAE and the Emirates, we're very lucky because we have a very small population that, uh, you know, for, for one reason or another, we, we got onto the, to the right track with, uh, when we first got, um, struck oil. Um, and so that allowed us to, to, to move in a certain direction. Uh, you know, there are other countries in the region um, that, have, that have suffered because of oil. Uh, and they are now facing, if I can use the word complex, uh, complex um, uh, problems, right? So, you know, you have, you have a low oil price now. People have been given a certain set of expectations. Um, they, they, people acted as though oil was going to be uh, there forever and, and at high prices. And so, you know, you have these massive families, um, uh, you know, ten, 10 children per family. Uh, all with the expectation that they're going to make um, a living off the government. Yeah? Turn up to work, get your, your pay, ah. and leave. Um, and so how are you going to sort of impose economic reforms on, on a country that, that with a mentality that is, is, is you know, heading off in a completely different direction? Uh, and I, I think that's going to be very interesting, uh, particularly in neighboring countries. Um, I, you know, we usually don't talk about other countries when, when, when you're a diplomat in the Arab world, but I mean, Saudi Arabia is a particularly interesting place, and there's a lot of exciting things going on there. Um, but, uh, but also, you know, if you think about how um, the economic reforms that are taking place in Saudi Arabia are, uh, are, are pushing Saudi Arabian society into a kind of, uh, uh, kind of a collision course with itself. There's a certain kind of mentality which is eternal and traditional and, you know, uh, there will be no change to our social lives. Uh, and then there is the economic pressure that is forcing them to change their, their social lives. Once their social lives change, their moral lives also come under question. So that's going to be very interesting. Mm. Um, just as an example, they have a Ministry of Entertainment. Now, entertainment is an interesting idea. Nobody else has a Ministry of Entertainment. It sounds like something out of uh, 1984. Um, <laughs> But it's actually incredibly important because uh, if you think about you think about a typical oil economy, it's uh, these um, there, there aren't that many jobs for people. You know, oil takes care of itself, um, and even if you have the petrochemicals industry, the, the number of employees around that is not a tremendous amount. And so um, they're trying to develop an entertainment industry and, and, and a service economy in order to to get more of a. The, uh, an economic flow, get more jobs out there. Uh, and yet the head mufti of Saudi Arabia two days ago came out and said entertainment and cinemas are you know, evil. Um, and so it's actually really very difficult for, for the royal family to push economic reform and a kind of liberal uh, opening up of society when you have certain mentalities that are incredibly powerful. Yeah. Um, you were active in the arts before you became a diplomat, I understand. Yeah. I was, um, yeah. Were there many transferable skills between the two? Uh, <laughs> well, it's called pretending, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Making yourself important, uh, deciding for younger people what should be done. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know, I, I sort of fell into diplomacy. Uh, uh, it, it wasn't exactly something that I had intended to do. Uh, and so I, you know, I, uh, I like to think uh, that I didn't ever get any diplomatic training, which is probably good because I, I, I broke all the rules. I was politically incorrect at the right time, uh, and uh, it's very useful, actually. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, all of the other ambassadors that I know are very kind of particular about protocol, um, and I think that's precisely why nobody ever remembers them. Um, I keep, you know, bumping into things and making mistakes and speaking to the wrong people. So, yeah. <laughs> And just one last question from me before we hand it over to the audience. Yep. Um, uh, after the book went to print, did you uh, suddenly remember any other themes that you should have touched on in a letter? No, I said to, I said to myself, thank God that's over. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I went climbing with uh, my uh, security men. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, we went climbing for the whole summer, actually. Where? Uh, in Mont Blanc area. It was fantastic. Yeah. I felt liberated. <laughs> <laughs> from the book. Yeah. Um, uh, so we'll open up to questions from the audience. Please go. There's a microphone in the center of the room in the back. Um, please go there because we're recording this, and that way we can record the question. Oh, no. I didn't know it was recorded. <laughs> you didn't? No. I didn't. OK. <laughs> Hi. 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 Thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Um, I have a question around uh, controversy. So um, it sounds like you're um, very open-minded about religion, uh -huh. um, but you come from a country that is that has very a big set of rules, right? Um, 
So how, like, how did you come about writing the book and how do you feel it is being accepted by the country? Have you had any, I don't know, kind of uh, fights around this? Or, yeah. you know, have you thought about like a PR strategy around making sure your country and yourself, who you yeah. actually represent, um, are not um, contradictive? Yeah, uh, no, I didn't. Um, and there is no PR that can do that. Um, I, 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 one of the things that I find interesting is that I've written the book and, uh, in a context. I'm not writing it as in some kind of opposition figure uh, or some kind of critical thinker. I actually, you know, I, my, my boss is the crown prince of Abu Dhabi and the foreign minister, his brother. Uh, and, you know, I, I spend time with the guys at national security because we have a lot of issues to discuss with Russia on um, uh, radicalization and, and, and the, the movement of... Uh, um, kind of uh, radicals between the countries and, and the region. Uh, and so I spent a lot of time with them. And, um, and so w w when I thought about writing the book, the, 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 I can tell you, it's very interesting. It was my 43rd birthday, and my father died when he, uh, he was 43. And I remember calling up the Crown Prince and asking if I could see him. And so he said yes. So I flew to, uh, to where he was at the time he was in Morocco. Um, and so on the, on the 43rd birthday, plus one day, I said, I, you know, I feel like I've got an extra lease on life because, you know, out of respect for my father, uh, I'd like to, to, to put together a book and, and start talking about big issues around Islam and, and, and the, the region. Uh, and part of the reason I wanted to do that, I explained to him, was that um, I look at, I, 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 you know, uh, watch international media. And I never see an Arab or a Muslim talking about the issues. It's always some foreign expert, uh, or it's always an, a non-Arab from the Middle East telling the world how things should be. So I said, I'd like to be able to, if I can, insert our perspective, um, uh, if, you, if you can actually describe it as a perspective, or if you could sum it up. I, I'd like to insert uh, myself into the, the global debate on these issues. And uh, you know, he said, go for it. Uh, I think he, he, he will be surprised, just as I am, that I actually, you know, I've, I've reached this stage. Uh, so, um, but, so I, I've been given all the support that I need, uh, which, and, and all the support that I need is permission to do it. Um, nobody's asked me what's in the book. Nobody in the government has said, you know, give us a text before you go and publish it. They've, I actually offered the government, I said, before it goes to publish it, I'd like to offer you a text. And they said, there's no need. We trust you. Go for it. Uh, and so, you know, um, in a sense, what this book is trying to do is, uh, is trying to map out a certain uh, set of thoughts in a constructive way um, so that other people can say, okay, well, you know, if he has spoken about it, if he's gone and um, uh, uh, kind of pushed this door open, then maybe we can follow. Uh, that's part of the thinking. And I was very surprised also because I, I was interviewed on uh, uh, Trevor Noah's show in the U.S. Uh, and, I, you know, that same day I had two interviews with CNN. Um, and... Uh, Nobody at home had, had uh, bothered to watch the CNN, but everybody had heard about the Trevor Noah show. And actually, which, which tells you something, right? Yep. Yeah. Um, uh, and actually what they did was uh, the Abu Dhabi TV, um, which is you know, Abu Dhabi TV, the capital of uh, the Emirates, um, took uh, clips of the Trevor Noah show and broadcast it uh, uh, with the nightly news um, and dubbed it into Arabic. So, you know, I'm, it's, it's a weird world, uh, to be honest. I think also part of the problem is that there are so many uh, uh, destructive ideas coming out of the region um, that uh, constructive ideas are now looked for. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not the only one. I mean, there are a whole bunch of other kids in, in um, kids, yeah, notice. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and old men uh, wor 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 working on these ideas. So, yeah, there you are. Thank you. My pleasure. So if this is um, the idea of the book is giving advice to younger Muslims, mm. um, what as a non-Muslim are the least helpful and most helpful thing you can do that would help reinforce or, you know, um, just make the advice not seem good? Does that, that question wasn't well phrased, but hopefully you got it, the gist. <laughs> perfectly phrased, but I didn't quite understand it. So, <laughs> so if you are trying to, I'd submit, I, I have, have to admit I haven't read the book, but if you are trying to, Counter um, counter stereotypes yeah. or bring in other ideas. Yeah. Then, as a non-Muslim, talking about those ideas or mm. possibly reinforce the stereotypes. What are unhelpful things I might do, or what are helpful things I might do? Yeah. Again, another difficult question. Huh? <laughs> um, you know, I think one of the problems is that even within the Muslim community, um, we have our own stereotypes about ourselves. Um, I think you you have to. Uh, 
you have to take into account that the Muslim community is, is many, many different communities, each of them thinking that they represent the whole. Uh, so, you know, in the Gulf, the Sunni Muslims, uh, of, of which I am one, uh, you know, we, we actually think that we are the ones who know Islam, right? Even though we're, we're, we're sort of uh, mixing up our own particular Bedouin Arab uh, desert culture uh, with Islam. Um, and so it, you, you've, there's a lot of, I think, there's a lot of confusion within the Muslim community globally um, about uh, whether we should take any responsibility for, you know, peripheral movements, whether we should uh, uh, be critical of ourselves or, or is that giving in to, would that be feeding Islamophobia? Uh, you know, whether we have anything to do with extremism, um, you know, I, I think just, just keep, keep it in mind that, you know, when, some, when a Muslim speaks to you uh, with, with confidence, uh, it's unlikely that that confidence is well founded. I think that, you know, we are in a situation where we have tremendous questions. We've got uh, a, a very, very um, elderly uh, clerical class that has um, very little idea of what's going on in the lives of, of young people. Um, although they do know how to use Twitter for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and I also think that it's, it's a, a massive problem that we're facing that we haven't been uh, really vocal about is the fact that we are, um, I think, uh, surprised by our own diversity. Um, that there is a tremendous range of uh, Islamic practices from the, from the uh, Sufis uh, to the Shia and to, the, uh, to, to ISIS, uh, which I do regard as Muslim. Uh, and all of these seem to be justifiable uh, expressions of Islam. And none of it makes sense to us, you know. Uh, people walking in the street simply don't understand how they fit into this world. So um, a lot of people sort of abdicate responsibility and say, you know, uh, I know what I was brought up as and I'm just going to focus on that and I'm going to close my eyes to things. And some very, very clever uh, people have said this to me and I'm, I'm quite shocked. Um, and so, you know, I, I would prefer to think of Islam as a continual debate um, rather than some kind of, you know, statement of principles, this is what it is, we are peaceful, leave us alone. Uh, I don't know if that helps you, uh, but um, they help me. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, um, Hi, thank you for being here, Ambassador Gobash. Yeah. Uh, it's a pleasure to hear your thoughts. Thank you. um, it was fascinating. I mean, I haven't read the book yet, but when I read the title... Uh, you guys Aladdin don't young... have to admit this, by the way. <laughs> yeah. um, I let it young Muslim. Yeah. I, I also come from a Muslim background, uh, yeah. from a Sunni background. Um, I actually even, in fact, share your first name, but I come from across the Arabian Sea. Um, what really kind of struck me was that, did you address this question in there? Because you talk in the preface about the power of ideas. Mm. And when I was growing up, I mean, you talk about what's happening, the difficulties in the Muslim world, mostly in the geopolitical sense, and being able to challenge the narrative which is being pushed by the fundamentalists on one hand. But I think at the same time, when we look at the literacy problems and everything else, it's also about the power of ideas. Mm -hmm. And as a young person, when you are reading science, you read Charles Darwin's theory of evolution, yeah. standard model, Big Bang Theory. Suddenly, you're also confronted with the idea about thinking and being able to think outside of the religion itself, right? Sure, yeah. And I think if you look in the, the Western world and the European space, the biggest achievement and success was being able to think broadly. Mm -hmm. And the Renaissance is what it did. We never had that. Maybe we had it. I was reading Karen Armstrong's book, Introduction yeah. to Islam, yeah. uh, a few days ago. And she talked about a period in about sites, you know. Um, Isn't it funny that we Muslims read Karen Armstrong? Well, I was, I was just yeah. wanted to, I wanted to kind of understand Hamlet. it. I thought it was the best possible description. It was wonderful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so... Did you think about that, I mean, as well in, the, in your letters to young people in a sense that when they face these questions beyond geopolitics, but being able to really be innovative, think freely, yeah, you uh, know, how do you address that? Well, you know, I was addressing uh, a certain context, yeah? Um, we don't have great scientific traditions mm. in particular. Um, for us to start, you know, thinking mo much more broadly. Mm. Our religious rhetoric all revolves around geopolitics. Uh, and that's why I really focused on that. Um, uh, and I suppose there was another reason that, uh, you know, my, uh, my editor um, uh, you know, cut out a chunk mm. and said, that's too long, nobody's going to read it. So I was forced to, to focus in on a certain number of areas. I think our problem is the rhetoric of geopolitics uh, more, more than anything else. Um, if, we could, if we could change the direction of our, our rhetoric to, to um, other areas, uh, more, more about, you know, personal responsibility and personal ethics, uh, then I think we're going to be able to open up to uh, you know, as you say, the sciences and, and the bigger kind of existential questions. 
Uh, but we're, we're, not, we're not comfortable in our own skin just in our own like, little environment. Yeah? Mm. We think the entire world is against us in some way. But do you think there's like a time thing that it can only be addressed in a linear way? Or do you think it could be broadly you know, at the same time? Well, you know, I, I would not be able to do that at this stage, personally. Uh, you know, I, I'm much more focused on the, the dialogue within the Muslim community between cleric and, and follower. Um, you know, if you don't break out of that kind of uh, uh, authoritarian um, religious relationship, uh, then it's very difficult to see what you're going to do with the rest of your life in our part of the world. You know, and again, when you think of some of the clerics with, they have 15 million followers, all, you know, uh, within, within the region, um, and they make their pronouncements uh, almost with glee, um, and yet the, the pronouncements are really very, uh, not, not particularly deep or useful, or, or um, they're just regurgitation of uh, various texts. And uh, so my, my focus is much more on on the, the way we already describe the world and trying to realign that description. Um, may, maybe, you know, there, there should be other people who go out and do, you know, um, do the kinds of thinking that you're talking about. But mine is this particular um, kind of field. I know it's a controversial topic. But thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so the inquisitive minds of Google. <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> Hi, uh, thanks for speaking to us. Sure. Um, so you mentioned uh, these kind of this, te this technology that's playing a role today, like Snapchat and Facebook, mm. um, and those are you know created by American companies, by Western companies. Um, and then you also mentioned this example of these headphones that read the Quran. Yeah. Um, are there other examples of you know information technology and social network technology coming out of the Muslim world, um, and you know, are some of them more constructive? And then is there more we could do as Google, perhaps, mm. to foster a technological contribution from, you know, the native society? Well, I'll tell you, com coming back to the clerics, actually, the, there's um, the, the leader of the, uh, the spiritual leader of the Muslim Brotherhood, um, uh, Al-Qaradawi. Uh, he's in his late 80s, and, you know, he makes various pronouncements on, you know, jihad now, and stop jihad, go back to doing more jihad. Uh, and, you know, he's a, he's, he's a very interesting guy. Um, he was asked about technology, and he said, it was a couple of years ago now, he said, we do not need, we as Muslims don't need to worry about uh, creating technology. God created the West to do that for us. <laughs> yeah. Now, I, yeah, it, it is funny, but it's also really, really deeply upsetting because it shows that he simply doesn't understand the way technology actually forms us and shapes us and directs us. Uh, and, and, and that's what I'd like to see uh, happening. I'd like to see uh, young Arabs and young Muslims actually engage in the understanding of what technology does to us. Yeah? Uh, and again, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm no great kind of theorist on this, but I'd like to explore that idea in more detail. So I'm getting in touch with a couple of academics who you know, uh, might be able to help me understand what, is it, what exactly is going on when, when we acquire these technologies? And when, uh, you know, we, we think of, uh, in, in, in the Arab world, unfortunately, uh, yeah, we think of technology transfer as the purchase of a factory and the establishing it in our country. For, for me, that is, you know, obviously doesn't make any sense. Uh, <laughs> it's a physical transfer of a, a lump of equipment, but it doesn't mean anything to us, yeah? Uh, and so I'd like to see um, younger people getting engaged in not just the creation of technology, but more the, the, the kind of the, uh, philosophical ramifications of, of technology. Um, and, you know, we, we do have uh, initiatives, again, in the Emirates, um, where, you know, we've got these ro robotic competitions and drone competitions, and we've got, you know, the New York University with its mathematics and computer science departments. But how, how are we looking at that, you know, fr from a global perspective and how we fit into, you know, the, the, the push of technology around the world? Um, and the other thing I think is important that, that we understand, does technology, I mean, in the Arab world, I think we need to think about it. Does technology have a life of its own and, and, and a logic of its own? Uh, and if it does, how do we in the Arab world respond to that? Do we contribute or do we, do we lay down our arms and just say, okay? Uh, what, 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 future do we, does, uh, what future do we have when uh, technology is coming from the outside into our area? Yeah. So. Do you think... This is something Google should be thinking about. Um, and uh, is there anything we could do in this space? You know, I'd, I'd love to continue all of these kind of questions with you guys on, on, a, on a kind of more practical level. Um, 
uh, off the top of my head, I don't know, because what I'm trying to do is pose questions and, and kind of provoke thinking. Um, but y you and Google have a, a global view. You, you have, you know, your, your understanding of, I mean, you create the technology, you have your understanding of technology. Um, and uh, I know that you've got your um, uh, think tank, Jigsaw, as well, right? Which has the geopolitical angle to it as well. So, I mean, there are a whole bunch of different things that, that could be done, but I, off the top of my head, I don't know. No? Hey. Thank you. Um, if I may stray a little bit from the topic, it's Please. like you are the uh, ambassador to Russia, and this, yeah. we seem to be in a very interesting time in the relationship of the West with Russia. Yeah. Uh, could you speak up a little bit about how you, you see the current situation and also what it looks like from the Arab world? Yeah, from the Arab world, it, uh, you know, nothing ever looks great. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I think one of my, my complaints um, uh, is that the Arab world is not formulating uh, proposals and uh, ideas uh, in, a, in a kind of a aggressive way. Um, so, you know, the, just recently the Russian foreign minister uh, hosted the Turkish and the uh, Iranian foreign ministers, as well as the defense ministers and the heads of their intelligence, intelligence uh, to discuss, um, you know, the zones of uh, influence in uh, Syria. And no Arab country had been invited. And it's, again, it's, for, for me, it's astonishing that we can be in the 21st century uh, with a population of 350 million people, 400 million, uh, and you know, supposed e e economic power, and we're not invited to a critical question like that. Even though you know, the Emirates, we have a very good relation with the Kremlin, with, uh, with the Russian government, with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And I, I, I wonder whether it's not uh, simply just a, the fact that we are unable to articulate what, what, what is going on in the region and articulate a way forward. Uh, and so, you know, the Turks come up and they say they know the way forward for the region. It's like, you know, what, what's going on? Um, so I think that, in general, that's the position uh, we're, we're in. Um, our our polit political figures are not uh, being sort of as clear as they can be about uh, the, way, the way the region can move forward. In general, I'm optimistic that Russian-American relations uh, will get better. And if they do, then we get to solve problems like Syria. Uh, the Syria problem started off as an Arab-Arab fight. Uh, which turned very bloody very quickly. And for some reason, I have no idea why or how, but it shows some kind of Arab genius, uh, we've managed to get uh, world powers involved in, in the conflict to the point where it's actually no longer in the hands of the players on the ground. It's, it's in the hands of you know, the US and, and Russia. And for me, it's fascinating to watch the, um, the way in which the, the uh, Americans and the Russians uh, interact uh, with a whole number of stereotypes. Um, uh, uh, that, that don't allow them to communicate very well. Uh, you know, Russia, Russia has changed um, radically in the last 20 years. Uh, it's, it's, it's become a, a very interesting place, to say the least. Uh, that was the diplomat's answer, I think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I, I wonder whether our friends in the US have caught up with the changes that are taking place. Um, I, you know, and a lot of people still uh, turn up with their uh, Soviet theories and, and their Kremlinology, uh, which is, it's, it's, it's a very different place today. Thank you. Sure. Um, right. Um, my question is actually about the tension and the relationship between the cler cler clerics and the state. Yeah. So usually we have in the Arab world this kind of tension. The clerics would say something the government yeah. would want to do to make some change. As an, as an example, the Ministry of Entertainment, you mentioned yeah. this, Sally. Yeah. Yeah. And then we have the clerics imposing a completely different. How do you envision what, what should we change to... Um, kind of draw a line where the, the power of the <coughs> clerics would stop and yeah. not actually turn into unwritten laws and sometimes actually even written laws. Yeah. You know, uh, again, he, here's where it's, I think it's, we're in a very interesting period. Um, obviously, again, Saudi Arabia is the, the linchpin of the, of the Gulf states, and, and it is the heartland of Sunni Islam, uh, and it is also the home of the, uh, the two holy shrines. So, um, what, what's interesting is um, recently the Crown Prince of Saudi, Deputy Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, made a statement, and uh, he said that you know we, we won't be driving cars, or women won't be driving cars anytime soon, but the reason is not religion; it is culture. And you know this is where uh, uh, kind of the, the religion and the state come together. Uh, there is an understanding in kind of Sunni political theory that the, the scholars will advise the ruler, but the ruler will decide uh, certain things. Um, and so the ruler here, so the ruling family, has decided, maybe it was an offhand comment, but it reveals a certain kind of thinking, that there are limits to religion, that religion actually operates here and the culture operates here. There may be an overlap, but 
So for me, it was fascinating because I always uh, I was brought up thinking that religion is everything. Religion covers all spheres of life. Every single act that you 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 can engage in has a religious coloring and a religious answer to it. Um, and so for for uh, uh, you know one of the leading forces in the uh, Saudi royal family to say there is a difference between culture and religion is a fascinating opening, uh, where now we can begin to say openly and uh, work out precisely where the borders, of, the boundaries of religion and boundaries of culture are. And perhaps there are other spheres as well. If there's culture, then there's knowledge as well. So maybe it isn't that all knowledge is contained in this book. There are other forms of knowledge. So I, I think it's a great um, opening. Thank you, Ambassador. I think that's some very uh, interesting observations. And you mentioned, you mentioned 1984 as well and, and kind of the limits of language. And I think it was like Wittgenstein has said that, you know, kind of the limits to my world are limits to my language. Mm. Um, it sounds like that's something you've thought about a lot. And as someone who doesn't really have any understanding of, of Arabic as a language, mm. do you yeah. think there's an intrinsic difference between uh, Arabic as a, uh, as, as, as a language and English as a language? And how do you see the kind of like social cultural landscape changing? Will it be that more Arab... Uh, 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 young men and women uh, learn English uh, uh, and communicate more in English, or is it yeah. more that uh, Arabic language will open up? Or yeah, well, I mean, that's why um, that, that's why I support things like a translation prize because I think the translation is something very important. Uh, I think it's almost a holy uh, 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 kind of venture, uh, and I think that translators in general are uh, overlooked in, in society. I think it's an immensely important thing that they do. Um, they really have to understand one society and uh, be able to sort of move ideas from one into the other. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you, I, I did sort of uh, come across Wittgenstein at some point. Uh, he, he affected me quite, quite seriously. Between the ages of 15 and 19, I stopped speaking because I wasn't sure. I <laughs> <laughs> wasn't sure what you meant or what I meant. Yeah? Um, but then I, I got over that, thank God. Um, but uh, he, he certainly made me think about language. And the fact that I was brought up speaking English and, and, and Russian rather than Arabic, uh, and, and that there was this great force, uh, kind of pressure on me to begin to learn to express myself in Arabic, very interesting. Um, I, I then began to understand that the problem in learning languages is not actually the learning of the language, it's understanding the mentality that you're entering. And uh, I would ask friends of mine who had, uh, you know, sort of, uh, there was a particular German friend. Uh, who is exceptionally op open-minded until he spoke Arabic. And all of a sudden, he became this kind of radical nationalist. And I was like, wait a second, where did this come from? And it turned out it's because that's the kind of thing that he had heard it being expressed uh, in Arabic. Those are the kinds of conversations that he was party to. Um, and I think that you know, language is an effort. Uh, you, know, you actually have to think in the language. Um, and uh, one of the problems that we have is that when we have this bubble, and we, I'm going to speak about Arabic. I mean, it may apply to other languages as well. But what I noticed is that we have this bubble where uh, it's just a certain, a certain set of ideas that are regulated, monitored, and, and, and limited uh, because of taboos, because of religion, because you know, nobody wants to rock the boat, uh, and because uh, you know, the, the Arab and Islamic world are, are um, obsessed with this idea of fitna or chaos, or social and, and, and moral chaos, that if some foreign uh, idea comes in, then this will threaten the foundations of our system, and then it'll be you know, death and destruction. Well, it turns out, yeah, it, it doesn't take much to turn our area into death and destruction. Um, but what we might need to do is, rather than um, uh, protect a brittle system where we don't have the words to express uh, uh, more complex ideas and more interesting ideas, more interesting policies, um, uh, w w rather than doing that, um, we should be pulling in as many ideas as possible. Integration instead of rejection. Uh, yes, and understand that integration is a form of, I suppose, digestion as opposed to an attack on us. Yeah? I mean, we're always worried that this is not going to be our culture anymore. But culture evolves all the bloody time. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I think um, and that, that's what we need to get. Yeah, sorry. I was going to say, I think we have time for one last question, if there's anyone else. Thank you for coming to speak to us. I, you mentioned or you alluded to the fact that there are a limited number of dissenting or objecting voices in Arabic. Um, or just a lack of people challenging the norm. Can more be done to surface that kind of content or support those voices who well, might be questioning? Uh, I'm not, I'm not so, I, I, maybe I, I misled you. There are many voices, uh, very many critical voices. There are very few, I believe, constructive voices. And that is part of the reason why we're also afraid of freedom of speech in the Arab world. Because what comes out when we open up 
is an immense amount of, of destruction. Uh, nobody has any kind of interesting, clear, creative ideas. Um, uh, constructive, forget creative, constructive ideas. Um, and I, uh, I, I for, for example, I mean, I look at um, the kind of political theories of the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, and I think to myself, you know, you, you've got this tremendous treasure of, of uh, Islamic <laughs> sources, and you come up with one thing, Islam is the answer, pray lots and we'll be okay. I mean, wait a second, do, do us all a favor and, and, and do your best to bring out the, the most constructive um, pos uh, possible interpretations. Or, for example, if you look at traditional Sunni political theory, it's based on the idea of there being a just ruler who is a good Muslim, controlled or, or somehow moderated by the presence of this group of Islamic scholars. But the theory kind of stops there. If the ruler is unjust, the scholars advise him, but they shouldn't push too hard because he has the, ch he might push back. If he pushes back, the system will collapse into fitna, chaos, and moral and social chaos. Okay, so we actually have a political theory that is built for tyranny. Yeah, it's like well, there are mechanisms out there in the world where we can pull them in to sh to to. Um, uh, uh, bring in some uh, simple accountability. I mean, we don't need to import democracy wholesale from, from outside, um, but we do need to think about the, 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 the systems that we have in place already. Thank you. Hmm, okay. <laughs> I think that's where we will leave it. Well, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.